Welcome to Dialogue Out Loud interviews. My name is Margaret Olson Hemming. I'm the art editor at Dialogue, a journal of Mormon thought. Today, I'm here with one of the artists who, whose art can be found on the cover of the fall 2023 issue of the journal. Esther Helani Kandari is primarily a figurative artist who explores concepts such as multiracial identity, gender and the female gaze in the context of religion, and the connections between ecology, culture, and sense of place. Much of her work draws upon her experiences growing up in Hawaii in an Asian American mixed race household. She holds a BFA from BYU Hawaii and an MFA from Liberty University and has studied at the New York Academy of Art. Esther, welcome. Thank you. So I'd like to talk a little bit about your background before we move into talking about this specific piece and then um, sort of your art in the broader community. Can you tell us, um, like, when did you first begin creating art? When did it become, you know, an important force in your life? Uh, it wasn't until college, basically, that I, I really decided to pursue art in a more serious level. I've been creative growing up, but not necessarily in what you, I'd say in an artistic way. I loved building things. I liked solving problems, but I was much more into science and that type of stuff. Um, and then I, I don't know, I got to college and realized I didn't want to spend my time in a lab. <laughs> and so kind of went back to like, okay, what do I enjoy doing? Solving problems, um, talking about things that I care about. And art is uh, a wonderful way to do both of those. Wonderful. Um, what were some challenges you faced in in choosing to pursue artistic study and, and become a, a working artist? I think... Like with any artist, um, it's not a career path you choose lightly. That's something I've taught high school and higher ed over the years. And it's something I always try to make sure my students understand that you can get a major, you know, like computer science or something like that, and just kind of go get a job. You can't do that with art. You have to really sell your soul to the idea of being an artist um, to make a career out of it. And so transitioning into that mindset after not thinking I was going to be an artist all going into college and even like the first I'd say two years of college I was still kind of on the oh you know maybe I'll teach maybe I'll do art therapy or something like that still kind of wanting to have a crutch to lean on and not really fully trying to pursue a, a career as a fine artist or working in the fine art world um and it yeah it took many just little leaps of courage <laughs> at various points um of deciding, okay, you know, I'm going to go get an MFA. And yes, you know, it'll be great because I can teach college if I need to, but I really do want to pursue trying to get my work into galleries and to to work, you know, freelance and all of those things. And then um, after I graduated from grad school, I, I worked as a high school teacher for a year full time. And I was also doing my studio work almost full time as well and um, was doing pretty well with that. And so I finally decided, I was like, okay, I'm going to pull the plug on my, my, uh, w-2 job and and go full-time freelance and that was a little terrifying because there's there's no guarantee and you're kind of at the wills and whims of the economy um working in the the commodity space basically as an artist and so having the faith that there's things that i needed to say that were important enough that i would find ways to do that and that god would provide ways for me to do that as well mm -hmm. Um, speaking of, of God and faith, a lot of your works are, you know, have to do with um, religious content in some way. You've done a series of paintings of Jesus. Um, you do lots of um, images of women in scriptural situations. And your cover piece um, is called She Who Shall Become. And there's lots of interesting religious symbolism uh, in the piece. Can you tell us just like what, why, do, why are you drawn to religious art, and what are you trying to express that is new in sort of to the Mormon art world through your your religious art? Yeah, totally. I think first off, to why I'm drawn to it. 
I, I was raised in a very religious household, a very spiritual household. And so it was always just a, a big part of how I view the world, um, how I view my role and responsibilities as part of a community. Um, and then also being on a mission, seeing the ways that well applied, well applied religiosity can really change lives. Um, but also how misapplied religiosity can really ruin lives at the same time. And so it was a, you know, an eye-opening experience of the power of it cutting both ways. Mm. And I think art is one of those areas that we don't often think about which way it's cutting within our religious space. Um, but it's also such a powerful and internationally reaching um, form of communication. I grew up traveling a lot, um, spent some time overseas in high school and things like that, and was acutely aware of the limitations of language <laughs> as someone who only speaks English as far as like practical levels of language. Um, and that's always frustrating when you're trying to connect with other humans, when you're trying to communicate things that care you that you care about. But art doesn't have those same limitations and that I've always found really attractive and really exciting. Um, and so when it comes to things that are deeply meaningful to people like spirituality and religiosity, um, being able to connect the dots with other people through a medium that's not as limited as, as language often is, um, is something that has a lot of power to put good into the world um, and to bridge gaps that can cause conflict otherwise. Um and as far as like how I see myself within the like Latter Day Saint space specifically, I I grew up in a very diverse uh, culture. Grew up in Hawaii. It's a very multicultural place. I grew up in a mixed race family, and so that was the way that I viewed the world. That's kind of how I thought the whole world was. Um, and then when I slowed down and started really seriously pursuing religious art, it doesn't take long to recognize that we traditionally have a dearth of diversity within Latter-day Saint religious art. And that did not at all reflect the congregations that I grew up going to and um, that were what I experienced and understood to be Zion. And so I wanted to create things that reflected that and to help people that I grew up with have things that reflected them and that they could connect with through cultural symbols or whatever it might be. And then two, just from a broader perspective, um, stories of women are often undertold in in most Christian circles. It's not something that is unique to our church. It's just uh, a facet of the way Christianity has evolved in a patriarchal world. And so finding ways to tell and retell stories that empower women um, through their spiritual and religious lives is, is something that I've always felt drawn to as a woman myself. Um, and as someone who often has conversations with other women as I'm creating work um, about what they what they need, what they're looking for. Um, and it's something that I tried to put back into the community. Mm. And and tell us about your the specific piece about she who shall overcome. Um like shall become. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Um uh, tell us that like there's, there's a, you know, I, I, um, I'll just pause right here. We, we, Daniel can put it up on the screen for people who are watching this. So, um, they can see it while you're talking about it. Um, but there will also be people who are just listening to it. So I'll just tell people that they Definitely. can see it on the website. Yeah. Um, but hopefully most people are also looking at, it. okay. Yeah. Um, okay. So tell us, Tell us a little bit about the symbolism of this piece, and I would encourage listeners to look at the website and and you know look at this piece and and kind of spend some time um, with the symbolism that's just really rich throughout this this piece. Can you tell us tell us how you chose the elements of it and the composition? Totally, I find that piece kind of fascinating to watch people interact with. It's somewhat of a litmus test of how much people have thought about women in religious art. And the most common response people have when they first see that image is they think it's Queen Esther, because that's one of the few stories they have of a royal empowered woman within their religious narrative. Um, and then others are like, OK, I don't think it's Esther. It doesn't quite make sense as Esther. I feel like there's some temple symbolism here, but I don't know what. Uh, 
and most people don't get it at face value, which is okay. Like there's so many layers to that piece. I spent like six months researching things or that piece is sort of a, a nerd brain dump for me. Um, but it was originally created as uh, a submission for the Search and Women show, which is an all Latter-day Saint women show that's held about every two or three years. It's curated by a local group of women artists. And the theme for that show was Heavenly Mother. But I just done a direct portrait of Heavenly Mother about a year and a half before for MacArthur Krishna's book um, that was in a Polynesian style and reflected a lot of my experiences growing up with, with amazing Polynesian matriarchs in my community. And so I didn't feel like I had an idea that did the concept of like a portrait of Heavenly Mother justice because I'd just done that. And so I wanted to express more my feelings about the theology of Heavenly Mother. And so this piece, and the reason it's titled She Who Shall Become, is based on a lot of wording actually in the temple ceremony, especially in initiatory ceremony, and the idea of what understanding um, the endowment process, but also understanding um, the doctrine that we shall become as God, um, and that there is a female aspect to God, a female God that we aspire to, and what that means for women. Um, and so the, a lot of the symbolism in that is this idea of a priestess and the ways that she communicates with God and the ways that she reflects God in her interactions with her community. So during the Middle um, Kingdom period in Egypt, there was a position within the royal family and in the high levels of their, their religious orders called the wife of God. And it was usually filled by either the mother, the wife, or the sister of the reigning pharaoh. And it was one of those things I just kind of stumbled across it when I was doing some research for another project. And um, I don't know if you've had this experience in research that you've done. It was one of those I felt very gypped because I grew up reading a lot of stuff about Egyptian mythology and culture and I was always really fascinated with it, but had never heard about this, even though it was a practice through a, a large chunk of Egyptian history. And so, you know, a little bit of this like, oh, darn you, patriarchy moments. Um, but yeah, it was just really exciting to see that there was practices and positions that reflected the things that I believed and that reflected, you know, eternal truths that have been repeated throughout time. And so a lot of those symbols are from um, Egyptian culture. Uh, particularly, there's a couple iterations of the symbols of Isis, the, god, the goddess Isis, because she represents this idea of resurrection and rebirth. Um, with the load, the load of form columns in the background as well that have references to that story mythology cycle. Um, and then on the columns are carvings from the Book of the Dead, which again, rebirth, um, this idea of progressing through lifetimes and such. Um, and then in her hand, she holds a scroll representing the idea of both creating and communicating law. And in her other hand, she holds a lamp, which in a lot of ancient um, religions you'd burn incense or other items to physically represent prayers this idea of your communications ascending into the heavens and so communicating with the divine um as as part of her role within the priesthood mm. yeah thank you i i love that and i had picked up on some of it and just some of it so it's great to hear your explanation um Tell us a little bit about your work within sort of larger issues of Mormon art or or Mormon studies or Mormon culture. Like, how do you see your art interacting with those things? Um, I think I'll start like broadly with my work. I was talking with um, Zach Davis recently. He's the executive director of Faith Matters, and I work closely on a lot of things. And we were discussing how hard it is for both of us to describe what we do for work per se, because, you know, while I'm a studio artist and I do that primarily, I do a lot of other things. Like I'm currently at the gallery doing stuff. Um, I do art editing for Wayfair and all these different projects. Um, and he's like, I describe my work as an orchestrator. And he's like, I feel like I'm a conductor. I often see my role as, as kind of like this orchestrator conductor that while I have my roots in the fine art world, I really care about building community. And so a lot of what I do is finding ways that I can use the resources and the opportunities that I have access for to build community, whether that's um, providing educational opportunities for artists and mentorship for artists who maybe aren't as far along in their career as I am, 
or helping to create sort of central points and resources for people who are looking to really enrich and expand and diversify um, how they're incorporating art in their religious lives. So like my work with Wayfair is very much um, in that realm where we're trying to create this this space that has a, a radiant celebration of um, the restored gospel and all of the different ways that you can look at it and different ways people are creating and reflection of their beliefs within that and also within a larger interfaith community that I've tried to um, curate in artists who are not of our faith or even of necessarily a Christian tradition, but are expressing things that are spiritual and uplifting and that I think we can all learn from. And then like with the art book that I curated this year, which is hopefully coming out next week, that I've had people that come to me all the time and say, I can't find a central place to get good diverse art. And so I was like, I guess we just need to make one. And I kept hoping somebody else would do it because I didn't really have the resources to do it or the time or the bandwidth. Um, but earlier this year, I was like, okay, I I just need to make this happen. And so I called up Mike Austin from BCC and was like, okay, here's what I can bring to the table. What can you bring to the table? Let, let's do this. And then we did uh, basically a crowd sourced our crowdfunding project um, to help fund it as well. And it's been amazing to see how that's come together. We ended up with, it's about a 120 page book with a little under a hundred images in it. Some of them were brand new ones that were created just for the book. Some of them are old ones that I dug out of archives or things that have been created over the last few years that I've kind of been keeping track of. Um, and it's been interesting as I've shown a couple people the previews of the book, their responses and sort of this excited almost relief i think is how i describe it in that some of them had been actively looking to see things that visually reflected the global nature and the diverse nature of the church and couldn't find it and others hadn't even realized that they've been looking for it but when they opened the book they're like oh wow like no this is this is what modern life looks like um but i'd never thought about the fact that maybe that wasn't reflected in the materials that i grew up with um so i'm excited to see how that percolates out once it's published well wow, that's great um and and remind us of the name of the book yeah so it's called um the book of mormon art book and it's gonna be part of a series so we'll do one to go with each of the come follow me curriculums mm -hmm. um and then the idea is if we've had if we've collected enough art again in four years to do another book of mormon one it'll be an issue two of it so well, theoretically infinitely has been expanding Wonderful. Well, I'm excited to see that. Well, thank you for being here. Um, before we go, can you tell us about where people can find more of your work and follow what you're sharing with the world? Yeah, totally. Um, best place to follow my work is usually Instagram. That's when I update the most. I have a website as well. So if you want to order prints and things like that, um, it's just my middle name. So www.heatlanifinearts.com. And then on Instagram, I'm Heatlani Fine Arts. Um, yeah, I, I just want to say I love to connect with people. I love um, trying to interact with my community as much as possible. I try to be an accessible artist. So whether you're an art enthusiast that has questions about art or you're, you know, in the Mormon studies space and want to talk about some of the research that I've done in regards to like art and communities, or if you're an artist and you want some tips, like I try to respond to my messages as much as I can because I've been really blessed by um, mentors who have given up their time and their resources and their perspective to get me where I am and so I try to do that in return for people. Wow that's so wonderful yeah I I really appreciate all the different places where you're building community and um, you know talking about various issues that you're seeing and how uh, how sort of the the vision of radiant Mormonism that you're you're part of so Thanks for doing that work. Thank you. Greetings, my name is Rebecca Deschweinitz and I'm thrilled to serve as a board member at the Dialogue Foundation and as one of the hosts of Dialogue Gospel Study. In each episode, which we record live the second and fourth Sunday of every month, we welcome esteemed speakers from a variety of backgrounds to share their insights and perspectives on the Come Follow Me lessons. 
Our aim is to spark meaningful conversations about the scriptures, to connect them to our personal experiences and to our understandings and explorations of the gospel. To stay in the loop with our upcoming lessons and this opportunity to engage with Mormon thought, culture, and belief, be sure to visit dialoguejournal.com and sign up for our newsletter. By doing so, you'll receive updates and timely links to join our live stream lessons. Additionally, you can catch up on our past guests and episodes by subscribing to Dialogue Journal on YouTube, Facebook, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Dialogue Podcast Network.